Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. The last episode of this Watchman series, we're dealing with the symbol of clouds. We noted that Jesus, his second coming, and the very important sign of that second coming is that he's coming in the clouds. He said in Revelation chapter 1, Behold, he cometh in the clouds. Matthew chapter 24, he said, After the tribulation of those days shall ye see the sign. He says the sign of the Son of Man. And, and the sign of the Son of Man coming. And he said that that sign was, Behold, he cometh in the clouds. And that's when he's going to send his angels out to gather together his elect from the He's going to blow a trumpet and gather all the saints and so on. But the sign that precipitates all of that is the sign of clouds. We noted that back in uh, Genesis chapter 9. God made a promise to the earth. He says, I understand humans are sinful, so I'm not going to destroy them with the flood of waters ever again. And I'm going to give them a sign of that. And the sign is, I'm going to put a rainbow in the clouds. And every time I bring a cloud over the land, very important that God said that in relating to Bible prophecy and what we're going to talk about today. He said, when you see the cloud, not if, but when you see the cloud, you're going to see the bow in the cloud, and that's going to be my sign, my token, that I'm going to keep my promise. So, you know, I was doing this study on Gog and who Gog is. Some say Gog is Russia, Gog and Magog and Meshach. Meshach is supposed to be Moscow. Gomer is supposed to be Germany. And I've been doing a, you know, a lot of research into that to try, to try to find out how true that is, but it just didn't, it just didn't sound right. You know, he says in Ezekiel 38, you know, that Gog is coming and that he's going to invade and he's coming riding on horses and he's carrying swords. I'm not aware of a Russian plan to invade any place where they have horses ready and they're going to go back to using swords again. So... It just kind of left me scratching my head until I realized that Gog was not a man. Gog was a spirit because it calls him a chief prince. Now, in Bible terms, we go to Ephesians chapter 6 where he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual, there's the word spirit, spiritual wickedness in high places. So it I think Gog and the people that he's coming with is a spirit and that army that he's bringing with him. Now, even though there may be some humans involved, I, of that I have no doubt, whether it's the Russians or the Canadians, because they're coming out of the north, right? And I notice that there's no landmass at the North Pole, and God specifically said that it's the North Country. Interesting that there's no land at the North Pole. It's all just water and ice. So anyway, I believe that Gog and his army that's coming is an army of spirits, very evil spirits. We would call them devils. Some people call them demons, but the Bible term is devils or evil angels or gods with a little g, but God is referring to them as a nation, a type of people. And then he said in Ezekiel 38 that when they come, their coming is going to be associated with the very same symbol that Jesus over and over and over gave us as the symbol of his second coming. Let's read it, Ezekiel 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince, there it is, he's a principality spirit, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And let me stop right here. Uh, a principality spirit. I've done a lot of teachings on this, but let me just cover it very quickly that I believe that nations around the world have a spirit that rules over them. 
we know from the Bible that there is a spirit that rules over the people of Persia or Iran. It's called the prince of the people of Persia. We know that Michael, the archangel, is the prince over the nation of Israel, the prince of the people of Israel. And so I have no doubt that Gog is a chief prince over certain tribes of the earth. He mentions Meshach and Tubal, and later on in um, Ezekiel 38, he talks about Gomer and Libya and Ethiopia. And, I'm, and let's get honest. Ethiopia is not known for their military prowess. They're not known for being a nation of military geniuses. And I'm not saying anything negative against Ethiopia. It's just that they're not known for their military strength, their military background, their, their invasions of neighboring you know, country. They're just not known for that. But at some point, I do believe that they're going to be involved in it, but because of the spirits that rule over them. And so when he talks about the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, I believe that there is a principality spirit that rules over the nations. There's one that I believe rules over the United States of America. We actually have it, I think, embedded as the symbol of the United States of America. It's in our Great Seal. I did a teachings, a Watchman video broadcast series on the Great Seal of the United States of America. And in that Great Seal, I break it down and I show you the types of spirits that I believe rule over this country. If you ever wonder why this country does some of the things it does, I think it's because there's a spirit that is controlling the people who are in power in this nation. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt. But let's move on, get back to this subject of clouds, because I think this symbol is very, very important. So he says, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, in verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, notice this, horses and horsemen, again, who invades with horses, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So I, I believe the Bible, I believe it's literalness. I don't believe that sword in this particular case is a metaphor for AK-47s or whatever. I believe they're carrying swords, but they are spirit swords. Swords that have an effect and a power over mankind that men cannot stand against and resist. That's because spirits are greater in might and power and the swords they carry, well, let's just say that if we put on body armor, you know, Kevlar and bulletproof vests, that won't help us against spirit swords, all right? But anyway, the symbol or what Gog is going to do when he invades this land of unwalled villages, what he becomes, he and his people, as they come riding in on their horses, well, notice what God said. Ezekiel 38, 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Did you notice the language of that verse? I mean, last time we were dealing with clouds, we talked, you know, they said there's going to come like a storm and like a cloud to cover the land. Did you notice what direction they came from? You know, clouds are up here, right? These clouds don't start out up here or else the Bible would have said, thou shalt descend and come like a storm and like a cloud, to be like a cloud to cover the land. But he didn't say they should descend. The Bible says they shall ascend. That means they're coming up. This army is not up in heaven somewhere. It's down below us in the pit, 
And when you see what I'm going to show you as we move through this, maybe this will start to make sense with you about where this army is coming from and why the symbolism of the cloud is so important. So my thinking is when this storm cloud comes over the land, we bring in Genesis 9, God says, when I bring the cloud over the land, you shall see the bow in the cloud. And that's going to be the sign that God is, in fact, going to keep his promise. Uh, remember in Joel chapter 2, the Bible says that the day of the Lord is a day of darkness and a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So I think Joel 2 is linked back with Ezekiel 38. Remember, what we're trying to understand from the Bible doesn't just come from one place. Isaiah 28 said it's here a little and there a little. And I think that certain things in the Bible link together by the symbolisms that they're associated with. So we have, in this case, in Joel chapter 2, he's talking about a nation coming. Ezekiel 38, he's talking about a nation coming but it's a nation of spirits. There has not been another nation on the earth ever like this, and there never will be. So this nation is unique from all of the other invaders, all of the other conquerors, all of the other people who wanted to conquer the world and conquer all the nations around them. This one's different. This one's actually going to succeed in conquering the entire world, all right? But he says that it's associated with the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is a very dark day, and it's a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then he jumps right into it and says, it's a people strong, there hath not been ever the like. And he goes on later in Joel chapter 2 to give some of the descriptions of that particular army. But one of the things that I uh, added into this was a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 28 when he talks about, you know, God's in Deuteronomy 28 is saying, I have these laws and if you keep these laws then I'll bless your land, I'll bless your fields, I'll bless your children, I'll bless your government, I'll bless your nation. But if you don't keep my laws, then I'm going to curse your land and there's things that I'm going to do you're not going to like. And one of them was in verse 49, the Lord shall bring a nation, which is a great people, which is, I believe, Gog and... Magog and all that, and nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now notice that this particular case, wherever the end of the earth is, I mean, think about the ramifications of that statement. When you start in one place in the earth and start walking or traveling or flying or in a boat or whatever, where do you find the end of a giant globe? Okay, where, where's the end of that? Well, God knows where it is. God knows where the end of a circle is, the end of a globe. God knows that. And he says at that point, at the end of the earth, that's where this nation is going to come from. And they are as swift as the eagle that flieth. I want you to take a look at this symbol. You recognize this, right? This is from the Great Seal, the United States of America. It is of a eagle, spread eagle with its wings out. I want you to think about this. In Matthew chapter 4, um, the book of Mark, the book of Luke chapter 8, and so no, it's Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. He gives the parable of the seed and the sower. And in that parable, he defines the language of symbolism in the Bible. He gives the symbol, and that is, you know, that some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the fowl of the air, the birds, came down and ate up all the scattered seed. Then he describes, he gives the interpretation of that. In one place, he says, Satan cometh. In another place, he says, the devil comes down. Either way, it's the devil or Satan or whatever. But we're dealing with the spirit. And the devil, we know, is a fiery flying serpent or a fiery flying dragon. And he has wings. So Jesus is teaching us the symbolism of birds in the Bible represent 
spirits, wings. Think of who the devil is. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So when I see an eagle as a symbol, I don't just think, you know, the, the beauty of the bald eagle. I think that this represents a spirit. Adolf Hitler, in his Third Reich, his Thousand Year Reich, his, one of his main symbols was that of an eagle. There were eagles all over Germany as symbols. And I believe that also was a principality spirit that ruled over Adolf Hitler and caused him to do what he did. But definitely this is a representation of a principality spirit that I believe rules over the United States of America. But I think also there's more to this symbol that's on the great seal than just the eagle with his wings. I want you to notice this. Let's break this down for a minute. We note that the eagle is a spirit like an angelic being. I want you to notice that he has olive branches in one claw and arrows in the other claw. You know what that represents? Well, the olive branch represents peace. When somebody says, I'm, I want to bring an olive branch, I want, I want peace. The arrows represent war. So we have a symbol of opposites. Peace is the opposite of war, and war is the opposite of peace. And yet, in this one image, this one eagle, he has the power of both, or he represents both, sort of like night and day, yin and yang sons of God, daughters of men. That's what that represents. And of course, there's 13, you know, leaves and berries in one claw, 13 arrows in the other. The number 13 plays into this as well. This is a divided kingdom that's coming as a cloud to cover the land. We note that the number 13 is relevant here. Revelation chapter 13 is where the beast and the false prophet shows up. Mystery Babylon. Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen words, all capital letters in your King James Bible. That is what that number 13 represents. So when you look at the great seal image here, you're seeing an image of the kingdom of Babylon or the fourth kingdom that's coming over this earth. You, when you look at the stars over the eagle's head, Stars are angels, either good or bad. We know that one-third of the angels, one-third of the stars, are going to fall to the earth. That's part of that fourth kingdom. So the image of star, and I have it, you can see my two yellow triangles. The stars are not just there in no particular form, they're there in the form of what some would say the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon, but it's a hexagram. It is a triangle pointing up and a triangle pointing down, and they're fused together like a Masonic square and compass, a yin and a yang, the male and the female, sons of God, daughters of men. But it's the fusion of opposites. And that's what you see in that star field. But notice, notice, I have an arrow pointing to it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 clouds. What was the sign of Jesus coming? He said, he said behold, I come in the clouds. And with everything that Christ does, there is an opposite to that, an opposing force. Christ, Antichrist. So as Christ is coming in the clouds, he's coming clothed in the clouds, surrounded by clouds, his appearing is going to, when you see the cloud, you're going to see the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the clouds. Likewise, this is a symbol for the Antichrist. And his kingdom is the kingdom of Babylon or the fourth kingdom and the Antichrist is a fusion of opposites. He is a son from earth and a son of the gods. The sons of God, the daughters of men, 
once again on this earth. There is another, there is another national symbol that represents the kingdom of the Antichrist. Where do you see it? Coming in the clouds just like Christ is. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Capitol Dome of Washington, D.C., the Capitol Building, on the inside, if you were to go inside the Capitol Rotunda, they call it, and look up, you're going to see a mural. And this mural is called the Apotheosis of George Washington. The original design of the Capitol Building was that down below the rotunda was supposed to be the final resting place of the first great president of the United States, George Washington. That's where his casket was supposed to be. They moved his burial site somewhere else, so he's not there, but it was supposed to be there. So underneath the rotunda is where George Washington was supposed to be laid, and the symbolism was that he is rising from the grave up through the rotunda, and in the dome of the rotunda, the dome always represents the dome of the heavens. You know, there's like a dome over us. And splayed up in that dome is the mural of George Washington, who's now risen from the dead and he's become a god. Are you kidding? This was supposed to be a Christian nation, right? This is as ungodly and unchristian as you can possibly imagine. So this really isn't it's not George Washington. Even though it looks like George Washington, it is not George Washington. It's the Antichrist. Let me show you what this mural looks like. You see, here's George. See, it looks like George Washington, right? He's got a sword in one hand. Stop right here. Remember, Gog comes in bearing a sword. He's got a sword in his hand. Take a look at it. And he's surrounded by goddesses. And each goddess has a star above her head, just like the stars we saw covered with clouds in the great seal of the United States of America. And stars are spirits. They're angels. Look at this mural again. All of these 13 goddesses with George Washington, surrounded by, and they're sitting in clouds. Notice George Washington, he's sitting on like a throne type thing. Notice underneath his feet, going from the bottom left, rising up, almost touching his feet, to the bottom right. It's a rainbow. You know, it took me a while. I never saw that. I looked at that before and I was focused on George Washington, but I never saw the clouds and I never saw the rainbow until just recently. And I went, what an abomination this is. See, I believe in God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and I believe in this Bible, and I believe that He is the bow in the clouds and He is coming again. And this anti-Christ image of a God, a man who was dead, rose from the dead, became a God, now lofted up in the heavens, surrounded by the goddesses, the stars, covered in the clouds with the rainbow. And it's, this is the opposite of what we see in Ezekiel chapter 1, and I'll get to that, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. But it just, boy, it gets me. Let's go back to Genesis 9 and see just how much of an abomination this is. Genesis 9, 8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you. Look at verse 14. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth. Think of Gog and that nation that's coming. 
that the bowl shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. Go back and look at this image of George Washington. That just, that infuriates me. This antichrist symbol over the most powerful voice in the entire world, which is the Congress of the United States. They're supposed to represent the will of the people. And yet I believe that the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of his kingdom, the spirit of that nation that's coming is what actually rules over the lawmakers of the United States of America. All you got to do is pay a little attention to what comes out of Capitol Hill and you'll see it. It is absolute pure ungodliness. You remembered that that rainbow was under the foot of George Washington sitting on the throne covered in the clouds surrounded by his 13 girlfriends or whatever. That to me, let me read Ezekiel 1 and you'll see what I'm saying. Above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, that's a reference back to Noah, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard the voice of one that spake. You see, Ezekiel sees the throne. He sees the four living creatures under there, one of which has an eagle's face. But anyway, he sees the four living creatures there and he sees the throne on the firmament. And he sees the likeness of a man on it, which is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And then he sees the likeness of the bow that is in the cloud surrounding all around that. And yet in this image of George Washington and the apotheosis of George Washington, that rainbow is under his feet. And the symbolism of feet is dominion. You have ten toes. Ten's a number for dominion. And anytime something is under your feet, that means you've conquered it. You see now why it infuriates me. That antichrist symbol where he has the clouds and the boat, which is the glory of the Lord and the promise of Christ coming. The promise of God's salvation is the rainbow in the clouds. And it's under this apotheosized George Washington. It's under his Feet, meaning he is risen above the heights of the clouds. Does that sound familiar to anybody? We look in Ezekiel chapter 10. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of of the Lord's glory. Look at that. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. Once again, Ezekiel's getting to see the glory of the Lord in the cloud, filling the house of God. Boy, I love this imagery. And to think that the Antichrist seeks to rise above even the glory of the Lord tells you the nature of the kingdom of Antichrist. We know in 2 Thessalonians 2 that he is God is sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Man. Um, if you have a Bible, turn to the 66th chapter of the Bible. It's not hard. Genesis has 50 chapters. So you add 16 to 50. So you're in Exodus chapter 16. Now, this is so cool because the <laughs> I'm just I'm laughing because I'm happy about this. In the 66th chapter, you have a picture of the appearance of the Bible. 
because it's in the 66th chapter of the Bible that God first introduces the bread of life. And the Hebrews called it manna. And that word manna means, what is it? They had no idea what it was that they were eating. But it was a picture of Jesus. It was a picture of the Word of God. And that's introduced in the 66th chapter of the Bible. And of course, the Bible has 66 books. But here's what I like about this, because in the 66th chapter of the Bible, let me read it to you. Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, look at it, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Do you see that? The 60, I want to give you this little understanding here. The 66th chapter would represent the Bible. Here we have manna introduced. It's the bread. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word is in the 66 books of your Bible. And in this chapter, you see the glory of the Lord in the cloud. See, in that previous verse in Ezekiel 10, we noted that the glory of the Lord in the cloud filled the whole house. Well, remember, you're the house of God. You're the temple of God. And so in the 66th chapter of the Bible, I think the symbolism of that is it's teaching you that if you want the glory of the Lord to, in the cloud to fill your house, read your Bible because that's where it's going to be. You know, I've been to a lot of churches in my life, and they all, in some cases, have very actively participated in services. I'll say it that way. And I'm not necessarily against that, except for when the emotionalism of an actively participated in church service becomes then the replacement for the real glory of the Lord. You know, we can work ourselves up into a religious fervor, right? But even cults do that. The uh, Sunni Muslims, they dance and they throw themselves around to such an estate that it puts them in an ecstatic state. Well, they don't believe in the Son of God, so we know that that's not the glory of the Lord, is it? And sometimes it just gets me when I see churches that are promoting this feeling as a replacement for where the real glory of the Lord is. And that is the Word of God. So keep this, you know, this point-counterpoint thing in mind, this Christ Antichrist idea. If Christ then appears in the 66th chapter as the glory of the Lord in the cloud, I mean, here we have a proto-second coming. We have a a symbol of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the 66th chapter of the Bible. If then Christ's coming is associated with the power and the glory and the majesty of the written word of God, the Antichrist coming is going to be absent the presence of the word of God. You know, God said in Amos, he said there's going to come a time when there's going to be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And I believe that in such a day as when the world tells God, shut up, the absence of the presence of the word of God, that I believe is when the Antichrist is going to show up. With what we've seen so far, the idea of Christ coming in the cloud and here in... Um, Revelation, uh, excuse me, Ezek I'm going to Revelation. Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, the, the bow in the cloud. And then Revel uh, Genesis chapter 9, the bow being in the cloud, the rainbow being in the cloud. In Exodus 16, the glory of the Lord, which is described in Ezekiel chapter 1 as the bow in the cloud, the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. I often wonder about 
Revelation 10. My personal idea, and I may do a series of video teachings on this, is why I believe Revelation 10 is actually the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take a look at it. Revelation chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now, let me stop right here. Yes, Jesus does appear in various places in the Bible as the angel of the Lord. Even God told Moses, I will send mine angel. And the King James translators made that a capital A. They, they, they were to watch for this angel to come lead them into the promised land. So, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, just like Jesus, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And a rainbow was upon his head. Stop right here. Remember, the rainbow in the cloud represents the glory of the Lord, and the rainbow is above his head. Remember where George Washington's rainbow was? It was under his stinking feet. You see what I'm saying there? That's a symbol of the Antichrist. This, I believe, let me just throw this in. God said, my glory will I, not, will I not share with another. So I believe that this mighty angel would have to be Jesus because the symbol of the rainbow in the cloud is the symbol for the glory of the Lord. Anyway, so let's just pretend right here that it is, even if we don't know for sure. A rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun. Okay, got to stop right here again. Matthew 17, when Jesus was transfigured, what did he look like? His face was as the sun. When John saw Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 on the Lord's day, his countenance was shining like the sun. Jesus in Malachi chapter 4 is the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. The Lord God is a sun and a shield, the Bible says. I just, I... I believe it's Jesus, all right? His face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. I stop right here. Remember when God led Israel through the promised land? He led them in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night. One pillar of fire in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, two pillars of fire. See it? And he had in his hand a little book open. That's because in Revelation 5, he just opened it. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. You see, I, I just believe that that's Jesus. And I want to take you through this, what we've learned so far. We know that Jesus is coming in the clouds. We know that the, the bow is going to be in the cloud in the day of rain. When God brings a cloud over the land, he's going to set the bow in it. In Ezekiel 1, he sees the symbol of a man or the figure of a man on the throne covered with clouds and a rainbow, and that's the glory of the Lord. In Ezekiel, Exodus chapter 16, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. We have here a mighty angel. I believe it's Jesus clothed with a cloud, a rainbow over his head. Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes, and the swaddling band of the earth is clouds. There's a story in the Bible of a beloved son of Jacob, and he gave his beloved son a very special and unique gift that he didn't give to any of his other, you know what it is, don't you? Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. A coat of many colors. His rainbow coat. So here's Joseph putting on a rainbow coat. And God said, I will put my bow, my many colors bow in the cloud in the day that the, I send the cloud over the land. Right? You get it? Isaiah 42 you'll see why I believe what I believe. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory 
will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven, what? Images. So you see now, George Washington with his feet over the bow. The bow is under his feet. He has risen above the heights of the clouds. Now you understand why I believe that this image of the apotheosis, the apostasy apotheosis of George Washington is not, that's not really George Washington. That's the Antichrist and it represents his kingdom, Gog, a nation from the end of the world that's going to come over, it's going to ascend over this earth like a cloud. You know, there's another connection with clouds associated with the Lord. You know, the Bible says he's coming in the clouds. Well, in Ezekiel 1, uh, Ezekiel says he sees the cloud coming from the north, right? He sees it coming from the north. And in that cloud then he sees the Lord sitting on a throne and it's on a firmament and there's four cherubs underneath it. And these four cherubs have wheels within wheels built into their bodies. So literally, the Lord is riding on a chariot made out of angels. And that's what the Bible actually says, that God rides a chariot and that chariot is made of angels. And I want you to kind of get this in your mind. In Isaiah chapter 19, behold, the Lord rideth upon a Swift cloud, the Bible says. Ezekiel chapter 1, looked, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And then he talks about the four living creatures. And in Psalm 68, 17, he says, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Remember what it was that took Ezekiel up into heaven. The Bible says a chariot of fire and a horses of fire. Remember, angels are made of fire. That's their substance. So even the, ch I mean, this is kind of weird to believe, but even the chariot itself was an angelic being. The very chariot of God is or are angels. Again, Christ, Antichrist, point, counterpoint, thesis, antithesis. I want you to think of opposites because I'm going to show you a, a series of images. I, when I, I, I caught on to this because I was watching a movie. You know, there's a ton of movies where man is visited by UFOs, aliens of different types. Is that all just science fiction? The people that see UFOs, is that all made up? Some of it is but a lot of it is not. I've been doing a lot of research this year. It seems like that's where the Lord's leading me into UFOs, and I know that may cut some people out, but my guess is that even some of you have seen a UFO, something moving around in the sky that you could not explain with anything else, and you were laughed at. You're ridiculed. ridiculed. There are portions of our government that are taking this UFO thing extremely seriously. I did a video on this called UFOs, Chariots of the Beast, and it occurred to me when the Bible says in Ezekiel 1 that the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Well, Ezekiel sees the throne of God and he calls the angels living creatures. John sees the throne of God and he calls the living creatures the angels beasts. So literally, the spirit of the beast is in the chariot wheels or in the chariot itself or is a chariot of some kind. Let me get to where I'm going here with this because there's a tarot card. The tarot deck sort of plays out the plan of Satan and his fourth kingdom. Now, I still have a lot of study to do on tarot cards and what exactly they mean, but some of them I get it. There's one tarot card called 
the chariot. And I want you to take a look at it as we read these verses. Jeremiah 4, 7, the lion is come up from his thicket. Who's that lion? It's not Jesus. It's the anti-Jesus, the destroying lion, the devouring lion. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. That, my friends, is the beast, the Antichrist. And he has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Now, in verse 13, here's what he says. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. You see? You see how everything that we've said so far now is condensed into this one chapter in Jeremiah chapter 4. The destroyer, the lion. Remember, the nation that comes in the book of Joel, they have the cheek teeth of lions. Satan is, is depicted as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's going to and fro in the earth looking for someone to devour. He's the opposite of the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the destroyer of the Gentiles, that phrase destroyer. In the Hebrew word, that is Abaddon. In the Greek, it's Apollyon. The destroyer is in Revelation chapter 9. He's the angel of the bottomless pit, and he ascends up like Gog and his army does. He ascends up, and part of his army, part of their look is that they have the teeth of lions. They are part lion, beast, spirit, devil creatures. And he's, this destroyer of the Gentiles is coming up as a cloud. That goes back to Ezekiel chapter 38. He's coming and he's going to cover the land like a cloud. And his chariots, his chariots, see those chariots are themselves devil beings or devil creatures or of the angelic realm and they themselves are chariots. Now, if that seems a little weird to you, we're right now in the process of making cars that at some point will be aware of themselves. They are smart cars, intelligent cars that do not need a human to tell them what to do. They are going to have their own personality and their own identity. We're making in this world what God has already made in the spirit world, and that is intelligent chariots. Dun, dun, dun. Cue the music, right? And notice this tarot card, the chariot. Notice that the two lions there, one's a male, one's a female, one's black and one's white. Notice the wings there. Notice the stars in the canopy above this man who, guess who that man is? riding in the chariot. He's coming up as a cloud in his chariots and his stars over his head. That means that's that kingdom, that fourth kingdom that's coming to rule over this earth, right there in that one card. Okay? And I remembered Steven Spielberg made a movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Now, he got that from J. Allen Hynek, who was part of Project Blue Book. The Air Force was investigating UFOs, and, and Hynek then classified these UFO encounters. Close encounter of the first kind was someone seeing an uh, unidentified flying object. Close encounter of the second kind is they saw the flying object land. A close encounter of the third kind is when they made contact with the aliens, and that's why Spielberg made this movie it was because man was going to make contact with these creatures and their magical chariots that can do things that no planes can do, right? Did you see that movie? Then it dawned on me in one scene where um, little Barry, I think is what his name was, a little boy gets abducted. That's a close encounter of the fourth kind relates to the fourth kingdom. When Barry gets abducted, she can see the UFOs coming. Take a look. They come in clouds, and they disappeared in clouds. Then later on, when one of the other main characters in the movie, Roy Neary, is chasing the UFOs along with these police officers, they disappear 
into the clouds. And then when they have the final act of the movie, the close encounter of the third kind, all of a sudden these clouds, and I actually saw documentaries on the special effects on this and how it was done. It was pretty cool. But all of these clouds are showing up and then all of a sudden these UFOs are coming down through the clouds and they're meeting, guess where? Devil's Tower. It's the opposite of the mountain of God where God descended from heaven to meet his 12 tribes at the mountain of God and God descends in the clouds. Here we have, Spielberg did this on purpose or a spirit was leading him to do this. He picked Devil's Tower. Did you know at one point in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, there's actually a reference to the movie, The Ten Commandments, where Moses meets with God and the 12 tribes at the mountain of God. You go watch it. You'll see it clear as day. Mom, the Ten Commandments are on. Dad said we could stay up and watch it. That's not an accident because these aliens throughout this movie pick people to come to the Tower of the Devil, Devil's Tower, Wyoming. And there just happens to be 12 of them show up at this mountain. Now, the military escorted most of them off, but two of the main characters got to actually, the, finally the, the main guy gets to go up in the UFO and leave the earth. I always felt like that's just waiting for a sequel of him to come back at some point. But here's what's really interesting about this film. And it was done deliberately. Spielberg mentioned the fact that he did not want this to come down. He wanted it to uh, ascend up. The mothership, remember the mother is the opposite of the father, right? When the, finally they showed the mothership, the first time you see it, it is coming up from behind Devil's Tower, not descending down. And Spielberg said this was deliberate. This is exactly what he wanted. He gave instructions to the guys that were doing the special effects, I want it to rise up from behind Devil's Tower. Gog ascending up. Mm, 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 mm. Then I started thinking about other movies where aliens and UFOs show up like to invade the earth, to conquer the earth, or to join with the earth. Spielberg made another movie called E.T. where this extraterrestrial comes comes falling down, his spaceship crashed. He comes falling down from the heavens, right? And E.T. dies. And then he's resurrected. And then he ascends back up into his, but he touches the third eye of little Elliot and he says, I'll be right here. And he's a lizard. He's a reptilian, right? Look at the spaceship. See, the spaceship's got teeth, doesn't it? Look at it. And it's ascending back up where? Into the clouds. The movie Arrival. You see the imagery? Every time that the hero of the movie, the heroine of the movie, was speaking to these aliens, these aliens were covered in clouds. And there were 12 of them, two in each ship that came to various parts of the earth. And it was all about the aliens and the humans working together for an event in the future that was going to happen to save the aliens. They came in the clouds. The movie Battleship, the aliens, here they are, they're falling stars and they're coming through from the clouds. War of the Worlds, the aliens, they descend through the earth, in the, they create these cloud storms, lightning comes down the earth and all of a sudden it resurrects these, it resurrects these Martian ships that have been in the ground for thousands of years, they come ascending up out of the earth. Do you see that? If you've not seen these movies, you'll probably go, I need to see that. The Avengers movie, the alien invasion of the earth, they're coming, look at here, they're coming down, they create a portal from wherever they are, open it up over New York City through the clouds. They're coming in the clouds. Even Superman, my favorite superhero as a boy, the man of steel, he comes falling down in his ship through the clouds. Starman, when the spaceship finally comes to pick him up, because he also, his spaceship crashed, he fell from the sky, he takes human DNA, becomes a human, so he's a hybrid. 
He's a God and a human in the same body. And he mates with the human woman. He's a son of the God who mates with the human woman and makes her pregnant. And he says, your child is going to be a great teacher in the earth. And then he ascends back up and is, look at his spaceship. Recognize that image? It looks like Saturn, doesn't it? You know what that is? It's a wheel within a wheel. My goodness. The movie Annihilation. In this particular movie, you never really get a clear idea of the aliens, whether they purposely landed here or they fell here. But these particular aliens have the ability to mingle themselves even with the DNA of man. And that is exactly what they do. And they come, take a look at it, they come falling through the cloud. Now, that's just a sampling of the movies that I had in my library because I researched these things. The movies that I had in my library of the space aliens and the UFOs or whatever, any kind of alien force that comes to the earth, generally, they're always coming in the clouds somehow, some way. You might know of other. You're probably th going to be thinking of movies that you think match that. But the idea is Christ Antichrist. Christ is coming clothed in the cloud. Face shining bright is the sun. He is the Son of God coming in the clouds, the Antichrist. I think arrives in a cloud of smoke. Revelation chapter 9. A smoke as of a great furnace. We'll talk about that next time. But that's where the Antichrist, I believe, the angel of the bottomless pit who is the king, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer of the Gentiles, is going to ascend up. Back in Ezekiel 38, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. And then again in verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now what we get from this I believe God, number one, is saying this cloud that covers the land is the very cloud that he referenced, I believe, in Genesis chapter 9 when he said, when I bring the cloud over the land, when I bring it, as if God knew that one day he was going to bring a cloud to be the swaddling band of the whole earth. He's going to cover the whole earth with a cloud, and it's going to cut off the sun from the earth. It's going to be a very dark gloomy day and he's bringing Gog and his army to this earth they're not here now they're not part of the political systems of this world they're far more superior and mightier than any army and any force on this earth if it were men other men could put it down but it's not just men these are devils these are spirits and men have no power against them and God's going to let them come over the earth as a cloud to cover the land. And for everybody that's lost, it's just too bad to be you. But for those who are saved, those who are born again, those who believe the word of God, we're told that he said, when I bring the cloud over the land, then look, you're going to see my promise there. You know, this, I'm a pastor, and so I care about people's needs, and I care about what's going on in their life, not just a prophecy reporter. And I care about you. I care about the clouds that God has brought over your life, the various things that have happened to you. Well, if you look in that cloud, I promise you, you're going to see the token of God's covenant and God's promise that He's made with you and that He offers to you. And the token of that is this bow in the cloud in the day of rain. It's the presence of Jesus Christ, the Word of God in your life to give you hope that when even all the clouds come over your life, 
Here is the very Son of God in that cloud to offer you salvation and to make a promise to you that He'll never break and He'll never rescind. We're seeing rainbows to this very day. Everybody sees rainbows all over the world. That means God's promise is still in effect and He's not going to violate His own word. So for all of you who are struggling with a cloud over your life, Open up the 66 pages of this book. It's the bread of life. It is the glory of the Lord to shine through in your life to show you that God is always going to be in the cloud, no matter what. You would not believe how difficult it was to make this recording. I start, I've been working on it for weeks. Started, I've started it and stopped it no less than probably 10 to 12 times. Glad I finally got it out, and I hope it's a blessing to you that when the cloud comes, Jesus is going to be in that cloud for you, all right? God bless you. I love you, and uh, I hope you enjoy the Watchman video broadcast. This is Pastor Mike. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.